Uh, so I titled my talk today, Observations, uh, because my work also I show today has not to do with the relationship with the site and the community and how I as an architect observe as I go along. And I try to really see what's behind everything and then also listen to as much as impose on what I do. So the architect's work is a balance between imposing your own vision, but really listening and balancing in making things come together. So I hope that it's helpful in working it together. So it will be very project. This is the context is Little Italy, where my office is in Seoul. And it's a very tiny little site, empty site, which is rare in New York, 20 feet wide and only 70 feet deep. And then this is the proposal from the building, and in this uh, fairly, you can see uniform textures. And what was interesting for me is I discovered the building code does not describe the style, but it says that you have to have the exact same proportion of existing building facade in relation to the glass to masonry, and to do that. So instead of having punch windows, I have proposed vertical surface of masonry together in a completely different style, but it totally is uh, conforms to the code. And one of the reasons I've done it is because uh, if you are in your streets are very narrow, you never actually have this view, front of you, that you are always traveling in a skew, meaning you're traveling sideways. So you perceive a facade and sideways, and there are four twisted pillars, so that as you go back and forth the street, you see the building differently, like it's differently. Sometimes it looks gray, black, depending on light. So this building, although it's very quiet, it actually animates the streets by being a quiet presence, but it has animated uh, effect on it. As a plan, it has too many stairs. It's going to be a uh, Probably more precious jewelry store or something. The owner really wanted to have some specific building to be on this site. And um, so this is actually the way it is. It's really uh, in terms of observation, we see the tall towers, vertical structure, and see as you can see that one. When you miniaturize in this context, how do you do that? And then uh, within this idea of looking through these edges as it twists up, um, we work uh, collaboratively with fabricator in Italy, the sustainably sourced black granite and use for digital fabrication methods and made in mechanical means to achieve this, these ideas going forward. Um, and then, of course, the proportion of a glass to masonry the same. So, in the sense, it's actually is helping from heat gain in the same sense. In the back of a facade, it's the same way, protecting itself, but it's twisted metal, protecting against the western sun. And so, this is a back facade. Uh, as you can actually see, this facade is very unusual that the back and front is not straight, the back is not very straight. You see this. And the back of a courtyard, it was lined up by this lit, uh, glass brick, which has this uh, uh, very different presence at night time. It's very important for activating this kind of courtyard. So this is more of an urban, my neighborhood idea in proposing a very different ideas for it. Um, next project that I also work on university project is this is with Brown University project. And uh, it's Watson Institute of uh, Public Policy and Political Sciences. It's uh, founded by Thomas Watson of IBM in the 60s, 60s. He was a Russian ambassador. He actually said that he went to Brown, and he's very grateful that he went to Brown. And then he said that there has to be a place in university where people can uh, have open debate about politics. And he has observed Russia during Cold War in isolation that you can't actually 
people living in a world like this is incredible foresight about this. And uh, the Rafael Vignon, he did the building on the gray, on your, on your left. And it was a series of offices for the professors. So my task was to build this small trapezoidal building, incorporate also a small building at the bottom. <coughs> And to provide actual forum to realize Tom uh, Watson's uh, dream, uh, Tom Watson Jr. by the dream to have a place of open debate. And uh, as I mentioned before, in Brown Campus, they have this policy of keeping the fabric, which they don't really allow architects to destroy it, but modify it. And so that where the arrow is more of a residential fabric, and, and then also to promote the porosity in campus. So in a sense, this is really a new part for this particular uh, Watson Institute of Political Science and Public Affairs. This is where people in political science and people who work in governments and foreign policies and uh, from a lot of countries, international students come and then uh, exchange ideas together to see how those buildings and the compound work together. So the result uh, is a new quad which has a glass facing, and then also a residential facade. I use the same wood, and that uh, wood building used to be a rooming house. It's completely converted to the seminar room. But then the new building has a glass bridge which reaches over to all building and embraces it. So as if you are part of us, you know, all the rooming house is classrooms, and the students can go back and forth using glass bridge. And this is like this house facing courtyard, which gives a lot of light. And uh, as opposed to here, you have lots of sun, but light is precious in New England. So the facing facade and spaces attract many students. So that's actually the courtyard side of what's happening to invite students in. So inside, I, what I created is uh, Agora, which is more central. It's not like a forum. Agora uh, refers to Greek tradition. In uh, original definition of democracy as a spatial component is that democracy exists within a reach of human voice. So that was a very important idea for me. And then also the idea that you can have open debate. So we work with Arab acoustics to make sure that when there's events going on, anybody from any place in this Agora can ask their questions, and there's a direct exchange and that sound enhancement that the audience is part of it. In fact, this particular forum is used uh, to debate on presidential elections, opposing views with Republicans uh, against Democrats, or even places from Arab countries and people from Israel. So the heated arguments had taken place in a civilized form. So I think that's actually very, very important. And especially like now, uh, basically social media, some people say destroy democracy because all the opinions are very extreme. That there are actual facts that spatially and architects to provide a space that safe, civilized dialogue which nuances of opinions can take place, but the important place for me. And they use it, and there's no debates going on, students are studying, and uh, it's actually fully occupied. And this is when some speakers are coming in, and the debate is going on. And this is my formal setup. So it's a lobby in my department's area, and Agora, as we talk about this. A couple other. Uh, community projects that I have worked with, at, which I will show, is Art New York, this uh, alliance with Asian Theatres New York, which is an interesting theatre group, about 300 independent theatre groups in New York. And as you can imagine, it's a very active group, but none of them has own theatres, none of them have rehearsal rooms. So this non-profits group helps them to write grants together. They actually share the overhead together. So it's like a mothership for all the non-profits, theater groups. And then within it, we have to devise a very, it's like flooding through a new development in big town, uh, entry, and also have a wild life theater in the space. And that's actually a uh, 
mezzanine space, space and, and also have a theater. Act. So these uh, can be rented out, they can do performances, and, and also it could be a rehearsal spaces. And the stage is set up so that it can be reconfigured as a larger stage, or it can be much more independent type of ideas. So this diverse idea of different type of staging, and also we can have all the windows open to enjoy daylight during the rehearsals. And then when it's performance, we have to control artificial lights because they are like that. So there's some of the elements of it very, very likely. Um, another public institution that we've been working for a number of years is a central branch of a Brooklyn public library in Grand Army Plaza. So in this uh, very important facade is facing Grand Army Plaza, which is the big oval. And you notice that it's actually not facing any community, that it's just a statue of more heroes or something. <laughs> so, in a way, like we are really working through the role of institutions, why is it facing them, why is it not facing the community? And in this particular master plan, um, we this is the facade, but this facade is very interesting instead of those, it was built in 1941, so the transition between. Uh, classicism into modernism, but this is like the era of Ori Alva Alto, if you can imagine it. So the figures are figures from uh, books, kids' books, Moby Dick. So in a way that these are heroes of our literature. So I think that's kind of very interesting that they have that not the classical uh, architecture, columns and characters and so forth, but they were original heroes. And we came up with different phases to consolidate all the staff and to maximize the public access. And luckily, the storage was centralized. We gave a lot of spaces. And, and then, and also to make the plaza more accessible, more open. And this was the lobby which we rehabilitated in the sense that uh, we were very faithful to the original design, but we wanted to make it a little bit glamorous. So that there's an interest from hipsters who move in and want to come in and enjoy the library. But in a way, this is a very, very interesting balance how to work it out. But uh, we hit the right mark because Netflix rented this lobby to uh, film a postal movie at the only airport in Paris and paid lots of money to the library, which was very helpful. So when the movie came out, I was looking at it. No, that's the library lobby of all the airport. So a uh, lot of times in this library, uh, we realize that uh, TVs, those uh, glamorous spaces are very attractive and then giving money to help them. Uh, library, because libraries where knowledge is offered for free to everybody. So that's a very rare thing that you have an institution which everybody takes to your space and their mothers can bring kids and leave them there alone and roll through and they get all the books they want and then it's where else is like heaven be. So this is Malcolm Center was built, Major Owens is a member of Congress and he was promoter of library. He helped the Congress to fund libraries all over the country. So instead of library of Congress, he's a congressman of a library, director of Congress. And he's black, and he has really uh, mentored many of African-American politicians in uh, Washington, D.C., New York, and so forth. So that's a uh, uh, first lobby. And, and also in the same spirit, as I mentioned before, the back of a library was facing community, and also back of a library was facing botanical gardens and a Brooklyn Museum. Uh, we said we have to build a new door. The back door becomes a real door for the community, so we call it City Commons, where the community can come and became a passport center, became a COVID testing center, vaccination center. So during the COVID, the library had to shut down, but this was open so that they had a grab and go, and they also had this as community services, so we actually kept it active. And some Wi Fi was outside of it and made it uh, easier for community to access. 
and renovation of business library yeah, in which um, as you can imagine, Brooklyn has a lot of startups and they come, they have meetings and they have rental rooms and they have assist uh, newly arrived immigrants in uh, preparing uh, resumes and so forth, workshops and different ideas. And then some business ideas uh, done in uh, much more spontaneous encounters are made here. Right at the entry, where this was uh, not underused area, is called non new and noteworthy. It's a new type of center. And you know, when we are doing a research on library master plan, we realize that librarians are the biggest asset they have. They are knowledge navigators. They actually know where to find what and how it relates to everything. So we ask each librarian to take the new publication, new books, but then assemble all the books from their knowledge to create different looks. So in a sense, it's really curated sections. It's been very popular with uh, the public. And some some librarians think it's related to food, some of them actually related to kids' literature, some to science fiction. So all of that very interesting uh, ideas in the back line. Uh, idea of a library as a made forward so that it actually communicates and participates with community activities. It's been very, very interesting ideas. Um, I will show some spaces in class, uh, which so also uh, these are uh, uh, gallery spaces, which I think is interesting because it is free for public. You can come in and look at it. This is the Peter Freeman Gallery, renovation in Soho. And so was where the art started with Castelli Gallery, but has been migrating to Chelsea of reclaiming a new place. And this particular uh, gallery had a very interesting lot line windows. And usually windows are considered to be not so great, especially in morning light. But it was very atmospheric. So we kept those windows and then chamfered it in a way it would bring in different light. And it turns out to be in the morning, it had a very, very different atmosphere in afternoons. And it is UV proof, but uh, artists worked very well with this particular ideas. And uh, it's made this space very unique. Luckily enough, New York City decided to build a park outside of it. So this lot line windows will be weather preserved as we know it. And I have to say that. I designed a gallery in Hollywood, which opened on Thursday, Shanghai, LA, and we had a similar concept. So uh, it's, it's going to be open to public uh, this coming Saturday, so you may want to see it. So to see, enjoy the Los Angeles light in a very different interpretation from this one. This is the kind of ideas, and because you have a beautiful light here. And I don't know why we don't bring it to gallery space. So we'll see how that happens. And this is uh, also uh, restoring uh, some of the original uh, glass uh, blocks, glass uh, skylights. We restored it and then uh, made it into a library space there. Another community, very, very different from New York context or uh, Brown context of Brooklyn, is. Uh, Center for Maine Contemporary Art in uh, Rockland, Maine. This Rockland, Maine is a very small town, about 8,000 population. It's best known as a lobster festival. It has nothing to do with us. And they have a blue, blueberry festival. They have a very famous Miss Lobster contest, which didn't go well with young ladies, so they changed to the sea goddess contest. <laughs> but uh, as you can see, the industrial port and to bring in an art center here was a challenge, but at the same time, uh, there's a major culture in it, and uh, there's a lot of interest by young people to make things on their own, and we made a courtyard here which makes it open to the community. So it's a waste, so they know what's going on inside, who is in there. It's open to public, so the court, it became a, a gave a courtyard as a public place. But I must confess that 
Harry Cobb observed it and had absolutely right uh, observation when he did it. He said that to Shinto, I don't think your client had enough budget to build the whole thing. So you just, that's why you have to give a courtyard and reduce the footprint. He's absolutely right. <laughs> Doing <laughs> sometimes do the cost reduction for the right reason to do the right solution. So this was very cost effective project for that uh, idea. And Jonathan Brodsky, who never showed a name, uh, came and showed it. Uh, and he did this first exhibition, and the sculpture is still there. At night time, you can see the openness. And he occupied his main gallery because it really was very much like his studio. He lived there for three weeks, and he wouldn't get out until we had done. This is the show's opening, public is coming. You have to stop. <laughs> installation where you kept working. So this idea of a gallery space is engaged with artists so they will feel like they are part of a space that they can actually work. Or another artist who had installed this enormous, beautiful uh, wave installation. Or a uh, lady world, very well known artist who gave artists. That's my grandchild. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Um, so, and then this is another gallery, and, and this is a lobby space. And I hear that you can also see the people who are working, lucky in these photos who are smiling. So, the idea that who's there, because institutions all uh, places plan for society in which it's actually alienate people, and so you don't feel like you belong there, you can go there. So in a sense, the idea of this openness for this institution is very, very important. It's, and it's been nearly six years. It's just been striving. More people came and named actually called Rockland the art capital of the state. So who knows? And, and this institution was also won a tourist award because they were able to prove that they contribute uh, more than $10 million annually of tourist income to this particular town. So this is actually something very interesting to make it an uh, institution which is, let's say, the common, uh, there's a common notion that one belongs and one can access. And also it has an art uh, classroom in which you can, kids can go anytime and try different kind of art materials. So the parents don't have to worry about buying the wrong type of crayons. The kids kind of know what. So, um, this is another project. This is again in northern part, uh, Buffalo, New York, and uh, it's addition <laughs> to the Northern Burnham Greenhouse. And this was built in 1899, second oldest uh, greenhouse by Northern Burnham, who started in Buffalo, New York. The first oldest one is Phipps Conservatory, Pittsburgh, by the way. So, it's a Victorian greenhouse. It has overgrown its own use, it's very small, and, and especially educational um, programs like Buffalo, New York, it snows all the time. They don't get to see palm trees like you see every day. And so when it's palm trees and warm tropical plants, they want to be here and they want to study, so they want to. And then also it's very, very popular wedding uh, venue. And so event space, a new exhibition space expansion, and it's a challenge. But at the same time, we actually came up with this idea using EPFE to expand using a curvilinear form, which is developed by what we call uh, ranging gables. So it starts from a typical greenhouse. You split it, you branch off the gables. By doing it, the structure, it, geometrically, it looks very complicated, but it has a regularity in terms of panel sizes, and uh, it has a logic in structure, which makes it uh, more cost-effective. So in a sense, it looks like something foreign, but it's related to the original typology. This is one of our detailed model of it, that we are in the middle of design development of this particular uh, project, working with Arab engineers. So the overall idea is going to be like that. It's one story addition. So we're always behind the historical 
project so that you actually don't see it until you go back into enter into it. So there's a, a historic elements are always dominant, and then usually become iconic, whereas the other one actually blends into more of a landscape, as you can see, like that. And that relates to uh, also structure we work with Schweiss Bergman, and this is a canopy for um, number, number seven line of subway line. It's the only public uh, transportation access to the longest paths we know. So we did um, two of them, and it's a uh, uh, dome, and uh, it's like a tunnel itself. It's hybrid uh, uh, dome, and, and at the same time, it has multi-dimensional orientation to work with organic shaped landscape, which is designed by uh, Michael Van Bagenberg's office, and also it's designed to take into account the wind. If you've ever been to Hudson Mirage in New York, it's incredibly windy. So this particular direction and curvature protects people against the strong wind. So once you come out, you don't get exposed to wind. Once you actually come under it, you are in a quiet protected zone for this. So we did this wind studies quite a bit. And, and there's a couple other negotiations with MTA, which is Sorry, authority, which has lots of regulations, and I don't go into the detail of it. Last two projects I show today is Project in Senegal, in which I've been working with Alvarez Foundation, Joseph and Annie Alvarez Foundation. And Joseph and Annie Alvarez uh, were refugees from Nazi Germany, originally came to Black Mountain College to teach art. And then Justice Harbour basically settled at Yale University, became the major teacher of art and art school, nearly for nearly every realm artist and legacy. But then they said that they established a foundation in the 70s and saying that they were refugees and they want to give back to whatever um, the money they make out of their artwork to give back to the community, which is the most underserved. So, so they identified this area in Senegal, which has the highest rate of maternal mortality and also highest rate of infant mortality, and there are no Western medicines. So our foundation has been working in this area for the last 25 years to have clinics built, maternal clinics built, and then uh, some uh, orphanages also, and then for the school of girls, because uh, Senegal is 90% Muslim, and it's a much more progressive liberal, but uh, still polygamy is uh, prominent, and it's because mothers die, and for survival, basically for survival reasons, and the kids die with high infant mortality, high maternal mortality force them for polygamy, and then some young girls are uh, uh, forced into marriages and so forth, so they have a shelter for young girls who had to escape and family won't take that. So the four year original field is uh, those shelters for young girls that can be protected. And, and also they have built agricultural schools to uh, tell, uh, teach them how to cultivate intelligently uh, plants, cultivation. Uh, so this center is in part of a clinic of this village uh, called Cynthia, and there are seven hundred residents. And uh, it's part of a clinic because the doctor here really thought that this uh, particular project is called Thread, is a Thread Cultural Center, that uh, certain extreme Muslim movement might uh, silence the freedom of expression of some of the tribes. And this is the area about 12 tribes live fairly peacefully, not fairly, completely peacefully together. They don't share languages, but they share music, they share arts, they share performances, and then coexist together that those uh, expressions should be uh, preserved. And then it becomes uh, places where they can have visitors, local visitors, to do workshops, or foreign visitors 
or artists from all over the world can come and exchange arts. So this actually became artist residency center. And the landscape is like that. So the gentleman in white is a Dr. Mageba, who came from this area and studied uh, medicine, but came back. And he's also the mastermind behind this whole thing, because in addition to uh, maternal infant mortality high, high rate, this is one of the highest rate for uh, migration for men. Uh, young men leave the community because there's no jobs. So he thought that this is very important to stabilize the population, to come up with new economic resources for both men and women and families, and, and also for public health. So performance is actually to teach people how to prevent malaria by installing and mosquito nets and so it was very interesting and enlightened individual and that's one of the reasons why uh, I was foundation has been supporting this particular doctor and the clinic in systems. Uh, so the project on the, your left side with systems is a threat cultural center and it's a multi-purpose area we uh, designed two courtyards because uh, some Muslim communities, men and women, gather separately. But this community, that wasn't the case. It was really generational. Older men, younger men, or younger kids, and older people, and they are doing different activities. So at one time, there were several different groups that are using this at the same time, as well as artists and religions. And one of the things we realized is that uh, there's a shortage of water. We are looking at the neighboring villages. Uh, well, if one villager digs a well, it dries up because of climate change. They had abundant aquifer, but aquifer is drying. But that's been causing uh, girls and women to go to far away places to have to procure water, uh, and which means that not only is it dangerous, bandits and animals, but also girls are missing uh, schools. They go to elementary school, but they don't go after, after that. So this is became a social problem as well. And the Dr. Mageba, if we talked about it, and we, Dr. Mageba said, let's do a survey. So he actually did survey and use of water, how many donkeys you have, how many uh, goats you have, and cows. And uh, it's very scientific. I don't think, I don't think Los Angeles has this data, neither does New York City. It's quite amazing how, how he was able to procure it. But we were able to quantify it. And then uh, we said we have a goal that this particular center has to the design of a roof that they can save the water maybe for general use, for like 30% of general use for help um, alleviate some of the social problems as we see today. They have a filtered water, drinking water in the clinic. So this is not for, for that, but for general use for washing, and they could use for cooking, but it's not for general drinking water, but basic need for water is what we needed. So that's one of the provisions we made. So that's actually collected and goes into uh, canal and goes into system. Also this idea of orienting it so that uh, ventilation is there. This temperature, now it's getting so hot around here, it's not unusual, but they're getting hotter to about 115 degrees as usual. And air has been very still, but this particular shape of roof creates a circuit. So it helps the hot air come, it goes up, and it helps the movement to give a sense of comfort. So that's the uh, overall idea. And, uh, and the technique, this was a challenge for me because this is going into an area where it's underserved, very poor, very remote, about eight hours drive from the car. So that material transportation cost is very, very disproportionately expensive. So we had to use local materials, a thatch, bamboo, mud brick, and work with local craftsmen to just give them jobs. And it doesn't make any sense to import construction workers from elsewhere. And another reason of that, if we use the local people to build it, they can keep maintaining it. By maintaining it, they get paid to keep up the building. So it becomes income, but they care for it. 
and also their sense of ownership when they build it. So we had really presented this project in a model form and worked with the site makers to figure out, and they gave me ideas. You got the angles wrong, you got the direction wrong, all that kind of situation. So I got collaborated with and would arrive at this particular area. And this particular model, uh, structural one, was designed with Strice Bergman's office in New York. And they made a, we made a fairly detailed computer model to analyze. And so this looks very simple looking patch roof, but it has a sophisticated technology built into it. But then we made it back into a building which can be built by hand uh, it, by the community. And the idea is to uh, have this compression uh, ring and then have very made our beams. And uh, some of the beams are doubled up when stress is needed, like in this corner. And so in the sense that it just uses a technique that the villagers have, but added elements and modified slightly to make a roof larger than their hut. So in a sense, what we did is we used vernacular building technology, but expanded it into an institutional scale by using um, more indigenous material and techniques. So, so that it belongs to this place and it does not look like imported from elsewhere, although it doesn't look like anything they have. So instead of uh, working drawings, we made this choreographic drawings. And oftentimes what they do is they actually use drums and with the music, they actually calibrate the cadence of how they build. And then you do this first, second, and third. And then with the modular element, they could really modulate it together. And they did this very, very beautifully, like this, this idea. And um, so this also, the little piece, uh, we had to add little steel, like small angles. And then some of them are wrapped up to reinforce the area. And my kids, are helping to build. They should be in school, I think. <laughs> it's more fun for them, so it's okay. Help. And the thatch builder uh, building, and the kids are looking at the canal being understood. Also, they are looking at Aniaba's textiles, and there's a relationship to thatch roof. This is a master thatch person, and he actually said that making traditional roof more dense will give them more insulation. And then thatch, has a very direction, so it really helps to shape water and with own angled elements. So there's actually a slightly different type of roof than they usually do. It's much denser, but it was very interesting. They looked at Aniaba's textile, and they said, oh, I know what to do. Honey's roof, or something like that. And the mud bricks are built on site, and luckily they have a proper type of mud which is very strong and high, um, much more as um, it's, it's got uh, its own strength, luckily. So they do, they make mud bricks when it's uh, hot season, dry season, a different dry season, and wet season. So that's, that's how they do it. And then also look at the example that Joseph Albers has designed. Uh, lot of uh, maquettes and also some of the brick walls for Yale and also Harvard. So they are looking at them. This is a uh, uh, Harvard Law School. And also incorporating more of a, uh, local patterns. And this was a brilliant idea because if you have sandstorms and this particular angles, let the ventilation come through, but let the sand slide off. So you don't actually get the wood. No one might get a little bit, but really we use this enormous amount of sand that can be coming in through this. So we incorporate that into this. And so this patterning and the making of a brick ball in this idea, like it's also uh, important because not only it gives a ventilation, but also privacy. That some animals you can actually cannot see through, but it provides enough ventilation. And also there are abundant example of Albert's foundation of all of us had their pictures and the books around. And looked at this is just about early uh, project in which 
He was very poor. I mean, he was at Bauhaus. He used the garbage in Bauhaus to make this a glass painting. So they looked at this and said, oh, we, can't, we have garbage. We have broken tiles. And that's in a tradition to use broken tiles to make floors. So it's like DIY. They started making their own beautiful floors on their own using uh, rejected broken tiles from the house. And they looked at uh, Ava's paintings here, and they said, this is like ideal wood. How we want to make this artistic floor? So that's actually what they did. Also, they looked at uh, Ava's furniture series. We can build them. <laughs> they built them. <laughs> and then they looked at also this uh, door. And my kids, they said, oh, oh, we can build them. So they <laughs> built the doors and furniture. And my like kids come there and hang out there. And this is a library for the uh, our library woman come and study and look at the ideas. It appeals to them because, as you can see, they wear very beautiful clothes and text. Uh, textiles and adding albums to very well known for is something that really resonates very well with them. And this was opening day, about 2,000 people came. So it can be a very, very large public event, but it can be a very, very intimate moment, like uh, what you see. A um, couple years later, we went back and they decided to have a garden with the water and the system system. And we create the economy to the women, and they are growing uh, different uh, types of plants. I think this okra, which is high priced, they usually have bananas, onions, and they are very abundant, but okra is rare, and they grow peppers and eggplants, high priced. So, with, with agricultural help, women made uh, this economic collective, and they have now had a Honey and ponyo with a kind of a very uh, gluten free couscous, <laughs> but grain which also sells. And these shares are important because uh, it costs about, about $20 a year for uh, each child to go to school. And so they actually make money, the kids go to school. And then uh, nutritional uh, food, like vegetables, helps with uh, a nutritional public health for the villagers in general. And they can be self-sustaining in terms of vegetables here. Yeah. So these are some of the photographs of gardens in process. Um, last project I saw I show is also related to that. When we are building it, a group of villagers from uh, across the river uh, from Pass came over. This Pass is a very, very conservative a Muslim community, but, but they, they said they never had a school and they want to have a school and can you help us design and build it? And we said, okay, but um, how do you do a school? So uh, this is actually a thread on the left side and the past school, but before that, we did a lot of uh, different uh, studies of possibilities of using but this particular technique. And part of this became an uh, exhibit at Chicago Architecture Biennale. But in the end, we actually ended up building this uh, in past school, but it took us three years to negotiate the curriculum because the elders said it has to be a Quran school and it has to be all boys. No, we have to have boys and girls study together. And there's a Christian village next to this. And the secular studies, they have to learn because the kids in this village, uh, they are illiterate. They couldn't count. And the idea of this extreme poverty and ignorance, those are lethal combinations for the kids going forward. And as you can imagine, Al-Qaeda was really recruiting these kids to take them to Mali. And the elders realized that they're signing documents which they don't know what they're saying. And they're taught something, but they can't really understand. They're just believing in it. So this idea of educating kids with secular knowledge, not only reading count, but also practical skills like cooking, public health, and uh, 
having to replace the skill sets. So they agreed to it finally. And then had uh, two teachers, there's a teacher's residence on one side. And so it had opened with that premise. And now she had the kids between age six and 10 attending them from all sorts of villages. So the idea is that this circular idea, but it's in different sexual ideas that each uh, classroom has a very different spatial ideas. And like in Sweden, uh, it has this, it's actually a very interesting material because it's dense, but it's coarse. So it protects you against the rain, but it lets the air flow through. So what happens is hot air comes in and slowly it goes up. So it actually creates a very effective static effect. So inside of this classroom without uh, air conditioning, it's actually cool. So uh, the school houses in Senegal, given by government, has a corrugated metal roof and it has the concrete block walls. Kids get cooked in there. It gets very hot, so they don't want to go to school. When it rains, it's too noisy. They can't get a teacher. So either kids study outside of those buildings because they don't go to school at all. And they learned when this was actually being built, um, they learned that inside it is actually cooler than outside. Oh, this is my team. Um, I call it in French, Monique. This is great. And this is the same team I work with in Sweat. And it's just across the river. So they were trained to do with a traditional technique, but they were able to build an institution, but they were able to build a school. And so they learned that it's actually cool. And it's actually attract kids because they want to be in a much cooler space. And than any place else. So this is at the school. And also as an oculi uh, creates a diverse shadow that they could be inside or outside the traditional part. You either inside at night time or outside. There's no gradation of idea of a shade. So if there's anything that I introduce to this culture, this idea of a shade, which they can be outside, but not under the sun, but under the shaded spaces, which also gives them opportunity for different activities that they haven't experienced before. So, um, and also we designed all the furniture. Uh, and then uh, idea of kids being able to participate and looking at the classrooms and, and wanted to be together. So I think they come from also from different villages from all over areas. And so this was very interesting project and very important project for me because more than anything, not only I was observing, I was listening. And it's not really collaboration, but I really worked with the community and then with the people to hopefully to make something that's actually viable come to place, which is functional, useful to the people. So the theme today of architects engaged is, in a way, this is kind of the right project to present, and it's not an easy way to work through. And also, I have to say, the last two project we work for Bono, and just because the kind of fee we get is totally in balance to the wages they get, literally. Architects we would even at the lowest end will help pay 40 people one year salary. So that's like there's no way. So in a way, we did this. We don't I don't encourage you to work for free for everything. <laughs> but I would say selectively. And maybe if if one of you will engage with one organization and do few to one, I think it will be very helpful. But and anyway, um, so, so this is the end of my talk. I hope uh, you are able to see some spectrum of interesting ideas. Thank you.